Okay. I will start with conventional greeting. Please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so welcome to the Rose Park Allah Shalom Memorial Evening. Put together. Oh, wait. Is that the car thing here? No, no, no. Oh, she's not here. Okay, we'll manage. By the, uh, the English Department of Mithalai Yushalayim and by the Center for Holocaust Studies. The Fog Harabanim, Dr. Rosenwasser, Dean of Mithalai Yushalayim, Revitzin Farbstein, who I assume coming in soon head of the Holocaust Study Center, distinguished teachers, colleagues, and Mahal students. Hi, I'm Mahal. And honored guests. Welcome to the Rose Starkala Shalom Memorial Evening. I'm Dr. Emmy Leigh Zitter, head of Mithala's English department and the moderator of the event. Here's an answer to Dr. Rosenwasser's question. Dr. Rosenwasser just asked me, how many years have we been doing this? Well, I made a calculation yesterday. If I'm not mistaken, and I'm not in the math department, so <laughs> no But if I'm not mistaken, this is the 13th year that Mithala, that the English Department and Holocaust Studies Center at Mithala have organized a special event together, and it is our 12th event, because we have to miss one year for reasons beyond our control. Okay, so I, I really just made that calculation yesterday, and I thought to myself, can I connect our evening to those significant numbers? 12 and 13, bat and bar mitzvah years. <laughs> now, for those of you who are new, you will find this out. During our evenings, we don't aim to depress anyone or frighten anyone. We don't whitewash the horrors of the Holocaust, but we want you to leave this room strengthened and inspired by our people's strength and their faith and their heroism. <laughs> but still, it is an evening about the Shoah and it's hardly time to throw candies or to pick up smiling young people on chairs and sing and dance around them. But then I thought about Bar and Bat Mitzvah children, and the connection came clear. We chose our theme months ago, Hearing Still Voices, the Children of the Holocaust. Tonight, I realized, we'll be focusing on children. On the more than one million of our sisters and brothers, and in my case, literally, my baby brother, most of whom never made it to bar or bar mitzvah age. <laughs> On those young children who perhaps turned 12 or 13 during the years of the war, commemorating or not commemorating their bat or bar mitzvah in hiding or starving in a ghetto. And on young people who were granted only a few short years after reaching Gil Hamid's vote to live as practicing adult <laughs> Jews before they were murdered for their Jewishness. Tonight we'll be thinking about those children who had so little time to fulfill mitzvot in this world before they were called in the innocence and purity of their young neshamot to fulfill the most difficult mitzvah of them all, giving their lives al Kiddush Hashem. We dedicate this evening to their memories. Now, to open the evening, it is my privilege to call upon Dr. Dvorah Rosenwasser, Dean of Nefola. Don't worry, I speak in English. <laughs> it's a horror, no? She said two words in Hebrew later. No. <laughs> I think I missed only two events, and this is one event I really tried never to miss. I don't come right from the airport to here. I find it very, very uplifting. We'll shoot everybody. I want to say something. Next week, we're starting in Yotzah Hashem what we call Parshiyot HaMishkan. Tuma, Petzabeh, I'm skipping Kitisa, Vayakhel and Tkudi. The major rabbis Hasidus realized that those Parshiyot always fall on Chodesh Adar. Amazing. You look in the calendars, you see? This Chodesh Adar, we have all of them. And they were wondering why is it? There's no coincidence in our religion. And they came up with a very, very interesting idea. They were talking about the Mishkan. What is the Mishkan? The Mishkan is Kadosh Rochu lowers down the Shekhinah to this world. Wow. Unbelievable. And the Ramban says that the Shekhinah in the Mishkan was the Shekhinah in Har Sinai that just waited to come down to be in the Mishkan. 
This is unbelievable. And what does Nasser reaction when they hear it, they're going to build a Mishkan? Pasha Truma next week tells us that Moses said, okay, I'll take Truma, donations from everybody. They give everything so fast that you have to say, stop, 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 enough, enough. I don't have Truma, I don't have to do it over there. Nasser was so excited about the idea of a Mishkan, about a place that they can go, they can worship Kadosh Bochu, they can fill the Shekhinah, and they donated everything. And the Simcha, you read the Psuk and you see the Simcha pouring out of them. And the Achdus of the entire nation, everybody gave. The poor is the rich, everybody. And by the way, we have Shabbat Shkadim coming up, which also, everybody gives the same amount of money. And this to remember exactly the donations to the Mishkan. And the Gdolia Hasidus said something very interesting. Why is it an Adar? Because the Matzah Shem soon will celebrate Purim. And what happened in Purim, according to the Megillah? In Purim, Nasser received the Torah with love, with happiness. Until then, was Chafa Alem Harkin Gigis, right? Last week, Parsha. Kodesh Bochu says, oh, you didn't take the Torah? Oh, you're going to die. So guess what they chose to do? But in time of Esther and Mordechai, Kimu Vekiblu HaYehudim Alehem. Now, what are the main mitzvahs of Purim? Mishloch Manot, Sudat Purim, Matanot La'Evyonim. This is the most Ben Adam Lechavero Yotef we have. The most of all. And they said this is very interesting. That's what Mishkan is all about. Mishkan is to unite the Jewish nation. It's to make them happy to give, to be Jewish, to practice Yiddishkeit. And Purim is exactly the same thing. We are very busy on Purim, just connecting with our Jewish people. What does it have to do with this evening? It's very nice for Torah, no? My parents, Alehem Shalom, created this place as a Mishkan. They refer to it as a Mishkan. It's called Mechlana. It's a Mishkan. It's a Mishkan for Kadosh Baruch Hu. It's a Mishkan for Torah. The most important word in this school is Torah and Mitzvot and a commitment to Torah and Mitzvot. And Besimcha. Ivdu et Hashem Besimcha. Baruch Hashem. If you come to Mechlana, you see all kinds of room people here that normally do not talk to each other, especially before elections. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody <laughs> talks to each other. There's unity. There's simcha. We are happy to be Jewish people here. And there's achdus, because Amy just m mentioned that she prepared this wonderful evening with the Holocaust Department, with Robert and Trapsey, with Dorit, I saw a second ago, oh, is, with other people, with other departments in Mechlela. People in Mechlela are happy to work together. They are happy to serve Hashem together, and that's something very, very unique. And I welcome, welcome all of you, and I'm thanking all of you for coming. And I hope you've enjoyed the evening. I'm sure not so sure you've enjoyed the evening. Go to the I'll share a, uh, a memory of your father, Nassau, of Rob Cooperman. When they first opened the room, for you it's the registration and refreshments room, but it's really the chad, called the Chadar Chavruta. And the girls learned there. And I remember I was sitting in my office here, and Rob Cooperman comes over and says, oh, I want to show you something. And there were three girls, and they were sitting together around the table, and one was wearing a, a shaykel, a payah, and one was wearing a mitpacha. In those days, mitpachas went down and not up, but it was still, it was still a mitpacha. And one was wearing a hat. And he said, this is what Michalat is all about. So that's what you've achieved. OK. Um, Dorit, is, is Esther coming? I know she has a wedding, but she helps. OK. This evening is named in memory of my mother, Mrs. Rose Stark, Shalom, an Auschwitz survivor. My mother spoke about her experiences at many of our earlier events, and even when she no longer had the physical strength to really speak, she would come. In the last year she came, she was in a wheelchair, attached to oxygen, but she came to give us a bracha. Every year she would begin by saying thank you to those of you in the audience who have come. And she'd always say, the chush of the audience here, a chush of the audience, right? And she would thank you, thank them, thank you, for taking time in a busy schedule to remember those who died 
and to honor those who survived and those who rebuilt our people. So, having learned this among innumerable other lessons that I learned from my mother, I would like to start the evening with thank yous. First of all, I speak with, I feel like I'm speaking my mother's words here. Thanks to all of you who came out this evening despite the dire weather forecasts. And Talma Talma Bracha, but they were talking about thunderstorms, so I, I do thank you. I know it wasn't easy and I heard that there were traffic problems, so a special thank you to all of you. Thank you to Mikhailov's administration for supporting this event all these years. And I don't know if she's here. Is Dini here? She's next door working. Thank you to Dini Goldstock. She's the secretary of the English department, and she makes all this possible. And this is absolutely literally true. I would, all week long, I've been making to-do lists, and then I would email them to Dini, and she said, I did it already. This, this is how it works in the English department. Another very special thanks goes to Revenant Rabbanit Revitzen Esther Farbstein, head of the Holocaust Studies Center. And to the dedicated staff, especially her assistant, Dorit Tepperberg. Thirteen years ago, Revitzen Farbstein came up with the idea of organizing an evening together. And over the years, my, my admiration, I know you don't want me to say this, but I'm saying it anyway, my awe for what she accomplishes has grown and grown. Her creativity, her academic rigor, the depth and breadth of her knowledge, and the sheer neshama that she puts into all her work continue to inspire me. Representative Barbstein, okay, and a uh, uh, warning here. You're about to hear Hebrew. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, after that it goes back to Brooklyn, not to work. <laughs> שלום לכולם, אני מדברת בעברית, אתם כבר זוכרים, אשתדל לדבר לאט. אמי, עם כל הרוח שלה והכיבוד הורים שלה שממשיך אחרי פטירת אימה, באמת מחברת אותנו עם הקהל החשוב הזה והנושא של זיכרון השואה. תודה, אמי. הנושא שאמי בחרה הערב יחד איתנו על הילדים, זה נושא שתמיד נוגע ללב, מה שנאמר נוגע ללב. אנחנו ערב פורים, אנחנו יודעים ערב פסח, ערב פורים, אנחנו יודעים מה זה משפחה, מה זה דורות, ואחד הדברים הנוראים שהיו בתקופה הזאת היו הניסיון של הנאצים לכרות את הדורות, ולכרות את הדורות זה אומר קודם כל את הילדים. אני רוצה לספר לכם על פרויקט מיוחד שאנחנו עושים כעת כאן במכללה, שנוגע גם לנושא הזה, ואולי יעניין אתכם ותוכלו לעזור לנו. תמיד הקהל שלנו הם תמיד גם שותפים. הרבה חומרים, מסמכים, אני מקבלת מהקהל שיושב אצלנו במכללה. הפרויקט שאנחנו עושים כעת הוא מכתבים ראשונים שנכתבו אחרי השואה. מכתבים ראשונים, אם אתם יודעים, יצא כבר ספר אחד ביד ושם. הספר של יד ושם הוא יפה אבל הוא מאוד כללי. אנחנו בדרך שלנו מחפשים מכתבים של אנשי אמונה, של יהודים מאמינים, שכתבו את המכתבים הראשונים אחרי השואה. <coughs> למי הם כתבו? על מי הם ידעו? זאת שאלה מאוד גדולה. אם הם היו מבוגרים, לפעמים הם ידעו שיש להם קרוב או קרובה. אם הם היו צעירים, הם לא ידעו אם יש להם קרובים, או שלא ידעו כתובת, אבל כתבו. כתבו לפעמים בלי כתובת. לכבוד הרב שמחה וסרמן, ניו יורק, אחד המכתבים. לכבוד הרב יוסה לוויינברג, כי ידעו שהוא פעיל בסלונים, ירושלים. והיו שידעו, שזכרו כמו והקפיאו את הכתובת וקצת ידעו. זה נושא מאוד מעניין, כי החיילים האמריקאים שבאו עם הצבא של ארצות הברית, הם היו הדואר הראשון. הם לקחו הרבה מכתבים, שלחו את זה בדואר הצבאי, דאגו שזה יגיע ועוד. בתוך המכתבים האלה, שאני... אחד הדברים הנוגעים ביותר זה מכתבים שמחפשים ילדים. אחותי השאירה ילדה, קוראים לה כך וכך, היא בלובלין. ניצול שואה, ילד שמחפש, 
הוא יודע שיש לו דוד במקום מסוים. הילדים תופסים מקום מיוחד במכתבים האלה, ואני אספר לכם סיפור של מכתב אחד מאוד מיוחד. מי שמכירה אולי בבני ברק, יש רבנית חשובה שנקראת הרבנית וולפו. היא אחות של הרבנית רישל קוטלר, זיכרונה לברכה, אשתו של רב שניאור קוטלר. והיא ניצולת שואה, הייתה ילדה קטנה בקובנה, הייתה בת חמש כשהתחילה שם המלחמה, בת שמונה בסוף המלחמה. אימא שלה, בקובנה, אימא שלה אה, לקחה אותה ממקום למקום. בסופו של דבר אימא שלה השאירה אותה בידי נוצרים, ואחרי המלחמה, הייתה שם הרבנית חיה שולמן, היו גם אחרים, הוציאו אותה מידי הנוצרים והביאו אותה לקובנה. היא גם בקובנה הייתה לבדה עד שהיא עלתה לארץ. כל השנים הרבנית וולפו, שהיא קרובה וחברה טובה שלי, כל השנים היא הייתה אומרת לי שהשנים של השואה היא לא כל כך זוכרת. היא עברה ממשפחה למשפחה, אבל היא זוכרת שאחרי השואה לא באו לחפש אותה. והיא אומרת, זה בשבילי טראומה. הייתי ילדה בת שמונה בקובנה. היא זוכרת שהרב אושרי שם עליה מפעם לפעם לב. היא זוכרת, אבל אף אחד לא חיפש אותי, היא אומרת. עד שבנס לקחו אותי לארץ איזה, ב- ב- באונייה, סיפור שלם. אבל היא אומרת, איך זה, איך זה, והיו לה, לה שתי אחיות. אחות אחת, הרבנית רישל, הייתה בשנחי במלחמה הזאת שנישאה לרב שניאו, <coughs> יצאה מוקדם, ואחות אחת, שאחר כך היא הייתה הרבנית רחל סרנה, היא הייתה גם כן בין גויים, ואחר כך בשוויץ, אבל איפה, איך לא חיפשו אותי, תמיד אומר. <coughs> ואני מחפשת בין המכתבים שמגיעים אליי, קיבלתי לרשותי גם את הארכיון של הרב אושרי מקובנה. ואני פתאום מוצאת מכתב מאוד מיוחד, ואחר כך עוד מכתב. ובמכתב הזה כותבת הרבנית רישל סרנה לרב אושר, איפה אחותי הקטנה שולמית? אנחנו מחפשים אותה, מחפשים אותה. ושמענו שאתה פגשת אותה בקובנה. איפה נמצאת שולמית? אני חייבת את זה לאימא שלי, אני חייבת את זה לעצמי, צריך למצוא את הילדה. והמכתב האחר הוא מהאחות רחל משוויץ. שכותבת. והאחות רחל הייתה בקורנה, היא יודעת איפה הייתה שולמית. היא לא יודעת שהוציאו אותה מבין מוכרים. והיא כותבת, היא הייתה אצל הכומר הזה והזה, בכתובת הזאת והזאת, תוציאו את שולמית. המכתבים האלה עשו לי זעזוע. הדבר הראשון שעשיתי, נסעתי לבני ברק לשולמית וולפו, ואמרתי לה, חיפשו אותך. ההתרגשות שהייתה לשולמית היא אדירה. שולמית באותו שבוע צילמה את המכתבים, העבירה את זה לכל הילדים, לכל הנכדים. היא אומרת, אילו, אילו הייתי יודעת את זה קודם, כל החיים שלי היו נראים אחרת. סיפור, היא, היא, היא ברוך השם הקימה משפחה ענפה, חשובה מאוד מאוד. היא בעצמה הייתה מנהלת בית ספר כל השנים, וזה... סיפור של ילדי השואה, כל אחד פלא, מחוץ לכל הגדרה פסיכולוגית, מחוץ לכל הגדרה סוציולוגית. הקדוש ברוך הוא נתן להם כוח מיוחד וחן מיוחד, והם בנו את בית ישראל. זה סיפור של מכתב אחד באמת יוצא דופן. אבל אולי אתם יודעים על עוד מכתבים, אולי תשמעו על עוד מכתבים. כל עוד הספר לא יוצא לאור, אנחנו רוצים להפוך אתכם לשותפים שלנו. ובינתיים אני מאחלת לכם ערב מעשיר, מעניין, וכל הברכות שבעזרת השם נראה את ילדינו בריאים, שלמים והולכים בדרך אבות. because we're going to be talking about a diary that just showed up 60 years after. It's about 60 years, right? After the, uh, after the Shavah. And what, what it tells us is that the story has not completely been told. Maybe it will never be completely told. There's so much yet to find out. And people like 
uh, Rabbi Farkstein and her, her staff. They're the ones who are, are looking for these, for these things. Okay. Uh, do you want to get the book on that? Okay, so, so Rabbi Farkstein just gave a beautiful bracha, and we're going to follow that with another bracha. And there's a little background here. Um, probably most of you, do you want to get up? Or, or, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay, here we go. Oh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> Okay, let me introduce you to Mrs. Eva Weiss from Chicago in Rehoboth, known in our family as Puppy Chicago. <laughs> That's how we in New York we called her. We, this is my mother's cousin, and she's an Ashwood survivor. My mother always gave a bracha, and this year we have asked Puppy to give a bracha to the Kahal. Can I just tell them the story about why we give the bracha? Okay. <laughs> okay, so some of the, um, a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this story. Was it the Satmar Rebbe? Yeah. It was the Satmar Rebbe was, was going to, to, I think, from New York to Israel, Israel to New York, I don't know. And, and his Hasidim came over and said, Rebbe, when you're away, who's going to give us a bracha? And the Rebbe answered, if you go to shul and you see a man and you see a number on his arm and he's wearing filling, that man can give a bracha. And my mother would always say, it's good for a man, it's good for a woman also. That was my mother's <laughs> But she was right. Uh, an Auschwitz survivor who, like Chavi, who is an uh, uh, Eva, Mrs. Weiss, <laughs> is, is a, an Auschwitz survivor who survived, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, survivors is not the perfect word. The best word is rebuilders. A woman who rebuilt her life and then her family and has a beautiful, beautiful family now. Baruch Hashem. Um, I give her to you to give a bracha to the Kahal. But I can't follow her and I can't follow the Rebbe's and I can't follow Rice. I'm not one of those speakers. But good evening, everybody. It's really, really unbelievable to see how many people really came. And all those young people in the back there, I mean, everybody else, but all the young people in the back, that they're really interested and they want to hear. Right, my name is Eva Weiss, and Emmy, as you know her for Professor Zitter, she's the daughter of my first cousin, Raisi Stark. That's all. Raisi and myself grew up next door to each other. That was a Munkach. And we were both sent to Auschwitz. We arrived in Auschwitz when I was 16 years old, in 1944. My whole family was with me at that time. My mother, my father, my brothers, my sisters, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, everybody was there, unfortunately. And luckily, my father and my brother and just a few of my cousins who returned. It does not matter that this was 76 years ago. I always remember them, and it always hurts. I am so, I was, came to America in 1948. I was lucky I got married. I got a wonderful, wonderful husband for 63 years. And we were so glad to build a beautiful family. We have grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Some are learning, some are working, <coughs> some are even the special forces of Sahau. 76 years ago, I would have never imagined that such a thing would ever happen, or that there are any Jewish people left in this world. Today, all of you are here, and you also had to live in Eretz Yisrael and in Yerushalayim. We have, we have a lot to be proud of and a lot to be thankful for. I wish all of you the best of luck to go from strength to strength in your daily endeavors. And thank you all for Thank you, Sammy. Okay, now I'm just going to speak a few minutes about my mother, and then we'll get to, to the to the uh, to the official speakers. Um, however, I need technical help here. Uh, uh, technical help here. <laughs> get, get me into the into the PowerPoint here. Um, many of you were so to know my mother. 
personally. Some of you heard her speak in those first five or six years she would, when she would speak. Uh, I just want to move it to the next slide. Yeah, okay. Oh, you know something? Uh, can someone hit the lights? Is Dini here? Does somebody who knows where the light switch is? Uh, I think it's on that wall somewhere. Do you know where it is? Ah, there. Okay, can everybody see? Um, okay, so as, as my cousin Fabi said, my mother was born in Munkach. Um, you're going to ask, so where's Munkach? And remember the little boy. Jelly. You're going to ask me where's Munkach, and I'll be Jewish and I'll answer with a question. What year are we talking about? Munkach switched from Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Russia, Ukraine, and the 20th century was a very turbulent time. But she was born in Munkach. Her father was Yisrael uh, Marsha, the Bekesha Schnader, the tailor who made Bekeshes. Her mother was Malka. Uh, among other things, Malka was known as a Zukrita. Do you know what a Zukrita is? In the back? On Friday nights, the women would come and she would read the Tzenarena to them. Uh, it wasn't such an easy life, but it was, it was a good life, no? Tell me, my mother, she had a lot of stories about the vibrant life of Monkaj with all the Hasidim. And it, it, was, it was a happy time to, for her to grow up there. Um, she did get married, and Chavi just said she remembers their wedding. She got married to Yossi Steiner. They had a baby, Shlem and Nochum. And Nochum, how do I move this to the next one? And then came Auschwitz. This is for me a, a hard picture to look at. It's my mother's arms. They all went to Auschwitz. Chavi just told you this, right? My mother went with her parents, her in-laws, her husband, her baby, and three sisters, Faiga, Sura, and Nessie, and their families, and of her immediate family, only she and one nephew came out a year later. My mother went then to Sweden for a few years. She was one of Count Bernadotte's uh, girls, and she went there for Shikom, uh, for, I'm sorry, rehabilitation. Um, she saw that the, a lot of the girls in Sweden um, were starting to assimilate. Most of them just wanted to get married and the, the, there was assimilation. She desperately wanted to come to Palestine, but she couldn't get what's called a certificate, right? Because she had an uncle in uh, America and she was told, look, there are so many Jewish girls who have no place in the world that will take them. You have an uncle in America, you have to go to America. So she did. And she got married there. And I'm addressing this to all you beautiful Macho girls, you seven girls. It's not the same time, thank God. It's, it's not the same circumstances, but you can learn some, a little bit a uh, lesson from, from my mother. Um, you all have your lists, right? The list, what you want when you're Katan. Your Katan somewhere has a list what he's looking for a palette. That's fine. My mother had a list too. She told us. She wanted a man who would be kind, and observant, and it was. And she found it. She found my father. He was 20 years older than she was. But she, with him, she made the family. And if you can tell me which one is me and which one is my sister, you're better than I am. I <laughs> <laughs> my mother never mixed us up, and since she's gone, we don't know any pictures anymore. Uh, I, assume I think I'm on the left because I look mischievous and she looks <laughs> okay, and we're jumping ahead. My mother did fulfill her dream of coming to live in Israel. She was in her 70s. She used to compare herself to Avram Avinu. She also left a, a nice settled home in Borough Park and came to Israel. And she said that in her 21 years living in Yerushalayim, she said never once for one minute did she ever regret that decision. Um, she would sometimes sit on her teeny weeny little mirpesa in Harnof. And you know what she'd say? She'd say, kick Hitler, ich weine in Yerushalayim. <laughs> For those who don't understand, love Hitler, you know, I live in Yerushalayim. She got her, we're not a people of, uh, we're not a vengeful people, right? Love to ti come below titar. But we're ones who remember, we want to seek justice, and we do know how to get revenge. And that was part of her revenge. Israel is part of our revenge. This is, was one of my mother's favorite pictures. This is my son. Who not only was hiding behind the column there. Uh, this was her, her first grandchild to serve in the Israeli army. 
And this was a very special moment for my mother. Uh, you can see her in the middle. This was just a few months before she died. She's on the oxygen. She doesn't look well. And many of her grandchildren are living here. And my sister in America brought all her children here. Um, this is, as far as I know, the only time my mother was there. I was surrounded by all 12 of her grandchildren. And I compared her before to Avram Avinu. Here she has, by comparing her to Yaakov Avinu with his 12 shvatim. So, I'm Baruch Hashem. We don't have a picture of everybody. We've been too many different places, but there have been many, many uh, great grandchildren also. So, I end with this picture of my mother, Ola Shalom, with one of her uh, great grandchildren, that's my granddaughter, Maria, on the way home from Hadassah before they went home. Every child would bring, what all of my children would bring their grandchildren, their children, my grandchildren, to see my mother, Ola Shalom. Me, Zechrona. All right. Oh, let's go back to this. Okay. Uh, I'm about to hit the wrong button. Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> he drives tanks and he fixes PowerPoints. He's very, very handy. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think now is Zahava and Toha. Are you ready? Okay. You've heard a lot of talk now, so let's have a little bit of music. Oh, you know what? Let me tell you something about this. First of all, let me tell you about these girls. So how about tell her you're here? Uh, there's a this. And there's a this. Can we put them together? Hold on. Tech support. Anyone know how to use these things? I blew in it. That's good. Can we put this in here? Uh, hey, not. <laughs> what am I doing? Oh, okay. Um, okay. Can we make this full? I want this to be full screen. Actually, I don't want this to be full screen. Um, Zahaba, you want to put on whatever you need to put on on the screen? Um, we're going to end there. First of all, this is Zahaba, Zahaba and Tohar. They are third year English department students. And they are very talented. And they're also very kind because they're in the middle of finals. And being third year students, it means they're also in the middle of their practical, which means three days a week. They are teachers. And yet, when I asked them to do this, they said they would do this. Um, they're going to play for you a song and so, since um, our, um, here. What? Oh, this has to be on. So let me just introduce you first. Oh, sure. Okay. Since we are talking about children, they're going to be playing a lullaby that was written at the end of the 20th, uh, 19th century that the children of the Shoah probably all knew and heard. Now, as it happens, if I tell her this just happened today, um, I'm, I'm going to quote your, your, your book. I picked up Rabbi Keller's book about the children of the Holocaust, and I started going through it. And I found on the first page, here's what he writes. As night falls in all corners of the world, in all households where there are parents and children, the tender music is the same. Listen carefully. Can you hear it? The timeless sound of a lullaby. The soothing voices of mother and father promising their babies that they are safe and protected, that all is right with the world. This has been the message of every lullaby in every language and culture since the days of antiquity. The word itself, some believe, derives from Lila. Did you know that? Not know that. The Hebrew word for night. Enveloped within a parent's solid embrace, lulled by a familiar bedtime song, children are, tri are, are reassured that no harm will ever come to them. But what happens when, in one dark, helpless moment in human history, this sacred promise from parent to child cannot be kept? Up in Pripperchik.
we're going to see it still now. But I just wanted to share one more thing. I, I of course, most of you are familiar with the beautiful moving song on the faces of these children. Um, many of you, perhaps like me, just really know the first stanza. And I looked into it. it has got, it's got several stanzas. Let me read you a translation of, of the last two stanzas. And I, this, to me, was also something I did not know. This is Adven Pripachik, the last stanzas in English. When you grow older, children, you will understand by yourselves how many tears lie in these letters and how much lament. And when you children will bear the exile and will be exhausted, may you derive strength from these letters. Look in at them. I'm sorry, that's the Hasidish way of saying it. My husband would say, Okay, um, let's see if we can again have some technical stuff going on here. Our, our next speaker will speak after the film. Okay, we have another speaker, and we are, we're about to introduce you to an extraordinary story of an extraordinary young woman who lived through the ghetto of Lodz, lived through Auschwitz, and I won't tell you more. Watch the film, and the film will be followed by Mrs. Hadassah Kalamish, who is a, a cousin. She'll, she'll tell you all about her relationship to, with Rick Delicious. Okay, now, but what I need to do now is get this out here. That is, wow. Okay, it is my pleasure to uh, uh, ask you saw her just, oops, you can look at my email. This is Hadassah Kalamish. You saw her in the film. Her mother is Mina. She will tell you all about her. Mina almost made it with her tonight, but it was too difficult. And, um, uh, Darin, you'll, you'll help her. Do you want the lights on or off? The lights will go off again. Okay, uh, and she's going to give you the, the personal family story behind this incredible story. After the Shoah tried not to speak of what she had gone through during the war. She decided to give me a happy life, a good life, a life lived without pain or sadness. It was a tough decision for her, and it was a tough decision for me as well. For despite the silence, the Shoah was a part of me. I am named of my maternal grandmother, Hadassah, who died of hunger in Lodge Ghetto. The Shoah is in my name. The Shoah went with, with me wherever I walked, but always in silence, without words. Seven years ago, I was contacted by Yad Vashem, Hadassah, we think, we have found a diary written by Rivka Lifshitz. Rivka, my mother's cousin from the Lodge Ghetto. I knew Rivka's name. I knew she had been with my mother during the war, but that was all. I didn't know anything more. What did she look like? What did she like to do? Who was her family? What was her father's name? Her mother's, her brother's, 
and, and sisters, I knew nothing. You can imagine the excitement, the emotion, the sheer curiosity that gripped me when I heard about the diary. From the pages of the diary, from Rivka's own words, I would get to know this lost cousin. I would find out about her life during the war. And I would find ab out about <coughs> my mother all the untold story that my mother never spoke and that I never asked about. And who knows, maybe in those pages, those words, I would find out more about myself as well. Rivka was 14 years old, like my granddaughter, when she wrote the diary. We have the pages from October 1943 through April 1944. The diary was everything to her. It was her life in the cruel reality of the ghetto. It was her soul, the soul of a young girl just growing up. It was her longing for her loved ones, her dreams for the future. It was everything. When she arrived in Auschwitz in August 1944, the Nazis took away everything. Her clothes, her hair, her name, everything, including her diary. The diary was taken from her and stored with all the belongings of those who passed through the menacing gate of Auschwitz. From this moment, our story is actually divided between the story of the diary and the story of Rivka. <coughs> the story of the diary you saw already in the short film. So I want to invite you to read these parts of this tremendous document with me as I share with you the emotion that we, her family, felt from the moment we got it in our hands. What did Rivka look like? I still have no idea. My mother was with her throughout the war. They shared the same harsh wooden bank, but she never was able to tell me what Rivka looked like. What color of her hair? Straight or curly? Was she tall or short, thin or heavy? She never said. She did tell me that Rifa grew up in a Haredic family, leaders in Lodge. Her father, Yaakov Aaron, a Shemi left his house about one week after the war broke out. The German caught him in the street and beat him without mercy. He died of his wounds after about a year. Miriam, Rivka's mother, died of starvation about three weeks before the big deportation, the Spera, the brutal deportation of more than 15,000 Jews, children, ill, and the elderly in September 1942. My grandmother, my grandparents, and Adasa Lifshitz adopt the orphan Rivka and her sister Tsipora. <coughs> Other uh, uh, aunt uh, took Tamara and Avramik. But then my grandfather was taken to Chelno and my grandmother died of starvation, leaving the three daughters and Rivka and her sister orphan. Alone. Alone. Five orphan girls living alone 
in a third floor apartment on an old broken down building, crammed together in a tiny bare room, no real floor, only three beds for the five of them, a small table on which they ate their meager meals, no bathroom, just a pail in the corner. The closet was made of these card boxes holding their few bites of clothing. A dim bulb hung from the ceiling, giving a meager illumination to the green scene, <laughs> and, leaving, and giving Rivka enough light to write by. This small, dreary room was the setting for all the drama written, writing, <coughs> written in the Rivka's diary. I invite you to join me in reading selection from the diary. Let the dim bulb that Rivka wrote by cast light on those terrible days in the Lodge Ghetto. Today, the Holocaust has become sometimes something far away, remote, inaccessible. Perhaps, as we read Rivka's diary, we will come closer to understanding the experience of those terrible days. We will share Rivka's emotion as she writes about the dilemmas she faced, her relationship with others, her love, her hopes, her dreams, and her faith. I've picked a selection that will introduce Rivka to us, that will give us a glimpse into the past, and give us as well thought and lesson for our own time. The first topic I've chosen is hunger, starvation, the lack of food that perhaps more than anything characterized the Holocaust. December 1944, Mrs. Marcus argued me, argued with me. She told there had never been hunger like this. Maybe that's true for her, but for us, for me, oh God, what we have already been through. When my mother was sick, I cooked 200 grams of, of potato to share between four of us. 200 grams of potato, one potato. To share between four of us. The potatoes went to mother. The three of us drank the water they were cooked in, and a teeny piece of, the, of potato just for the taste. Again, I'm writing about food. What's happened to me? When I think of food, I feel delight and disgust. Two absolute opposites. What a contradiction. But they somehow do go together. But enough already, enough about food. The lack of food was one of the causes of tension and even crisis between people in the Lodge ghetto. The ghetto was closed, sealed, cut off, completely under control of the Germans. The lack of food also causes a crisis in the house of the five orphans. The worst incident happened when Rivka's sister, Tsipora, realized that a little jelly had disappeared. Then it was a bite of sugar. The next day, a portion of bread. Everybody blamed the other one. Rivka thought it was my mother, Mina. So, though she didn't name her directly. 
she wrote, this God, this courage. Oh God, if I can't <coughs> trust even these people, who can I trust? Who? This is also the fault of the ghetto. A drop of jelly, please. Imagine it. Put it in your mouth. Roll it in your tongue. Do you feel the taste? How long does the taste remain in one mouth? How much does it help fill and empty aging stomach in a cruel time of hunger? The diary illustrates the narrow line between life and death that was constant fact of the ghetto life. If you ate, you lived. If you didn't have food, you died. A stolen teaspoon of jelly, so small, so worthless, testifies to the desire for life and the inability to predict who would live and who would die. Do we have the right to judge them? Can you even begin to imagine what we would do in their place? When I think about the awful hunger that my mother experienced, perhaps I understand a little better the atmosphere in the home in which I grew up. As a child, I didn't understand why my mother made me eat even when I wasn't hungry. Why it was absolutely forbidden to throw away food. I didn't understand the sentence, eat, eat, so you won't be hungry. Until today, I am compelled to finish whatever in on my plate. Until today, when I shop, I buy out half the supermarket. <laughs> Until today, I, second generation, know the fear of hunger and my daughters too. It's, it's going to the third generation too. <coughs> After reading Rivka's diary, I've come better to understand how my mother feared losing me as she had lost her own mother, Safta Hadassah, and her sister, Hannah, from starvation. My mother had sworn to herself that she would guard me, protect me, and above all, feed me. <laughs> I feel I have to ask her forgiveness. I was a poor eater. Oy, oy, oy. I made her so many troubles. But now I understand how much pain that must have caused her. If she will be here, I will ask the forgiveness in front of you. <laughs> The next topic I want to ex uh, explore is family. April 5, 1944. When I remember that now I can't look at my father just as his photograph, but never again at my living father, my living father, I will never see him again. God, how awful this is. Now come the third little seder without my father, the second without any man at all. Last year we had Hadassah, but today Esther. Oh, how tragic it is. Is only a, if only Avrami were here, oh God, Dafka on Pesach on Seder night to be left without a father. Oh how I miss him. I miss them so much and I feel guilty. Maybe if Avrami looked stronger, they wouldn't have taken him. He was such a good boy. He gave me his bread so many times. Is that why he looked weak? I am full of regret. regret. I feel like crying, <coughs> crying, crying. I even feel like howling. One of the tougher ways 
that Rivka dealt with the pain of her losses was through her feeling of guilt. Why didn't I do enough to prevent the tragedies? Did the tragedies happen because of me? Which bring us to the question of survival guilt. They die, I didn't. This is a feeling that every survivor has faced, the pain of guilt. <coughs> the fact was, Rivka and Zipporah joined the family already living in extreme poverty and in a teeny crowded apartment, a family in distress, facing hunger and starvation. And now, here were two more mouths to feed from the teeny bites of food given sprangly. Five orphans living in one room, no adults to guide them. Is it any wonder that there were moments of tension and suspicious between them? This was yet another tragedy brought upon them by the Nazis. Can you even begin to imagine the significance of the loss of the family, the root of all that is secure and stable? So many survivors consciously decided to build family at, at any cost. The security and the stability that family gives the security and stability that was stolen from them was more important than anything. The survivor often see in their rebuilt family the ultimate revenge against the Nazis. My mother would say, they, saw, they thought they would destroy us, but we arose from the ashes and built new family. True hero. Wow. I was the first blossom that bloomed from the ashes of my mother family, a blossom rooted in the painful history of our people. And now my mother has a great, great, great child. <laughs> we would ever dreamed of that? Really, we can't imagine it. The next topic I'd like to touch on is Rivka's incredible strengths in dealing with the hardest of hard times. Rivka, faith in Hashem is the main source of the strengths that she displayed. February, 1944. Ha! I laughed at all the world. I am the pitiful Jew in the ghetto. I am the one who doesn't know what will be with me tomorrow. I laugh at all the world because I have a road to lean on the greatest, largest possible world, my faith. I have faith, and that makes me stronger and richer and worth more than everyone. Hashem, I thank you so much. <coughs> Rivka saw those who did lose their faith. She was thankful that hers stayed firm. In, in, uh, in uh, 12 February 1944, she wrote, if I didn't have my faith, I, like so many others, would lose my desire to live. Patience, with Hashem's help, all will be well. Rivka's faith wasn't simply a matter of religion. In such a harsh, harsh reality, a person need to hold on to something, to something, some thought or feeling that will help him to deal. 
Today, today was a chaos all around him, with a feeling of being cut off from normal life, with the knowledge that one is an orphan. But what helped her keep her hope, her dream, in a better future? Twenty-nine March forty-four. The only thing that gives me a drop of strength is, as I mentioned before, the hope and faith that things <coughs> won't be like this forever. I am young now. Perhaps one day something will come of me. Perhaps someday I'll be able to accomplish something. I have to have hope. And that's why I'm a Jew, so I can have faith and have hope. I hope that this hope stand on a strong, firm foundation. God, bring that better time quickly. It's amazing. No? The next issue. Shalom Shir. Okay. The next issue I want to look at it is writing. To write. Simply to write. Then I can forget about food and all our trouble. I wish that Hashem would give Sarah, Sarah it's her, her mentor, health and happiness because she gave me the amazing idea to write a diary. Occasionally, when I think about writing, I feel like I can't write a word. But when I start writing, I have so much to say, I almost don't know where to start. So Rivka wrote and wrote. She wrote her heart and soul in the miserable room by the light of a dim bulb. 120 pages of cramped handwriting, 120 pages of her thoughts, her feelings, her longing for those she had, lo she had lost. Writing in a diary gave Rivka moments of comfort, a chance to express what was in her heart. That might be true of everyone who writes a diary but how much more so for Rivka, writing under unendurable circumstances. Writing the journal allowed her to examine her set of values and her perspective and to express her gratitude for her belief. She even dared to dream of writing as a vocation. Love. In addition to her faith, love was a source of Rivka's strengths, one that helped her endure despite her anguish. In spite of her losses, she felt love, perhaps even more remarkable. <coughs> she was even able to feel, to give love. Here is in her own words. I mentioned in a letter that I was enveloped in a kind of emotion. I couldn't give it a name. But now I know, for sure, it's love. I feel kind of love, of affection. So strong, it almost make me want to cry. I want to surround the whole world, hug it, warm it up. I have a desire to do a lot for the world. Rivka loved the whole world. She was grateful for every flower that grew nearby, for good weather. It's almost frightening to read how much hope was within her as she wrote in the diary just a day before the deportation from the ghetto. Thank God for springtime, and thank God for my mood today. I don't want to write much about it. I don't want to spoil anything, but I'll write the single word, the most important word anyway, hope. When I read 
this election, I was amazed. How did Rivka, just 14 years old, find a way to strengthen herself, her faith, her hope? How did she gain such strength from her writing? How could she even think of the future in a place of hopelessness and despair? The world hope and the next day deportation. As what happened to Rivka? She survived Auschwitz with my mother. They sent to concentration camp and even she survived the death march. She was liberated <coughs> on April 1945 in Bergen-Belsen. She was very ill, weak and close to death. The doctor said she will not survive. My mother assumed she died and left her behind and didn't look for her till the diary come up to our life. But later, much later, seven years ago, we found out it didn't happen that way. It seemed that somehow Rivka hang on to life for at least five months after the war's end. We learned that from a document signed by her in which she asked to make Aliyah and to be reunited with her surviving cousin. But she never made it. There is no record of Rivka reaching Israel, no documentation, no information. Her trail is lost. Her trail is lost, but her words have returned to us. When I think about the trail that her diary look, took from Lodge to Auschwitz, from Auschwitz to Russia, from Russia to San Francisco, from San Francisco to Israel, um, I, I have no doubt about Hashem Hashgacha. God's hands is clear. Rivka's diary was left behind in Auschwitz, but her, whole, uh, her words live on. Once Rivka's diary returned to us, we decided to spread her story throughout the world. We want to immortalize her, her strength, her faith, faith during the, dark, the darkest of the days. To share with the world the extraordinary personality of a young girl who kept dreaming on the future during the nightmare of her present, we hope to share the unquenchable love that we, her family, feel for her by sharing with you her story and especially her own words. We love her so much and from this moment all of you, please, read her, read her words, think of her, and love her, and have her faith in her. Thank you very much. Somehow uh, there is uh, uh, other other colors. 
different colors. Sometimes it's a blue, sometimes it's a green, sometimes you can see. But in the end, it's the color of the ghetto. 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 It's the color of the in Yad Vashem. In Yad Vashem. In Yad Vashem. Does your family have access to Yad Vashem? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. You can go to see it too. Everyone can go. But we need to invite. The book is published? The translation? Ah. Thank you for the question. The book, the book, the book is published last year, last year, here in the Vichlana, in the book. And it's available afterwards for sale in the in in the, Hebrew? <laughs> the Hebrew one is available here for sale and in English. There is in English, I, but I don't know where I, you can buy it. Where can you buy it? I think it's on Amazon, but I will Amazon. check. If you yeah. like, I, 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 I'll, I'll yeah. see if I can find the link and I'll send it to you. No, no, no. No, no. It was mentioned that the diary was found were the uh, uh, in Auschwitz? Where was it found? Uh, I know that no, it's, a, it's a big problem. It's, it's a big problem. problem. As you uh, as you as you saw in the film, uh, the doctor that found it uh, took a, a, a newspaper with a, a photograph with a, a the oven and and she write. Uh, here I found it, but it can't be. It can't be because there's. It can't be. We think it was in Canada, where all the belongings to the uh, people that came to Auschwitz they took it to a big, big, big machzalim. So, so, so this, uh, I think it was Canada? there. Uh, Canada? Canada. In Auschwitz, in Auschwitz, there was an area called the Canada, okay. and that was a storeroom, so they think yeah. that's where it was. That wasn't. Okay. Before, before she left her duty in, in Auschwitz, she took it. She she tried to translate it, but she couldn't. This was the doctor. The doctor in Russia. The doctor. She tried and to look. Maybe she knows who uh, who write it. But she couldn't do it, so she, she left it. And then, 70, <laughs> she's, uh, he is uh, six weeks. Oh. Uh, um, and uh, my sister, uh, she lives here in Baibagan, and she has 13 children, and more than 40 grandchildren, but it's only the beginning. <laughs> I, I just want to add one thing that, that I mean, it was what what a story and, and what a person. And yes, we do love Rivka. That, that's when Adasta says she wants us to love Rivka. And one of the things I loved is when she said in that very moving uh, entry that she she wants to accomplish something with her life. There wasn't much time given her. But look what she has accomplished. It took the years, but and and her voice, the coldest of hearing stilled voices. Her voice was stilled, but we're still hearing it, and we will go on. Oh, thank you so much. Do you have something on the computer? Okay, how do we get rid of this back here? Oh, okay. Let there be light and let there be Rabbi Hanoch Teller. He needs some very little introduction. He is fresh from London and on your way to America, or fresh from America on your way to London. Uh, do you even know? <laughs> this is our, uh, I, last year I asked Rabbi Teller, and I, we almost had him last year, and then APAC called, and I could not, I couldn't compete with APAC. We are very, very, very privileged to have a, a man who, who created a genre. I mean, I'm a literature teacher. Kind of Teller stories. He created them, and he will share 
um, his wisdom and his stories with us tonight. Chairperson Dr. Zitter, Roshan Michalab, Dr. Rosenwasser, Narayan Rabutai, cherished colleagues, notable students, ladies and gentlemen. I teach Michalab, I don't get to say that too often. Uh, I think you want to hear another speech like I want to be a ballerina dancer. So uh, we'll telescopically condense. Uh, can you raise the microphone? I can raise it. Yeah. <laughs> I teach you, I know. Uh, you know, Dr. Rosen also began by saying, Erev Tov, and everybody got frustrated. I spoke this past week in uh, South Carolina to 1,500 Christians about the Holocaust. And I began for 25 very long seconds speaking in Yiddish. <laughs> and they, they freaked. <laughs> but they recovered afterwards. Okay. Before I begin the plight of children, I'm really going to do this. Listen quickly. To, I think we've heard going too long. Uh, before I begin to relate to children of the Holocaust, I want to relate my thoughts as a young boy regarding the Holocaust. I'm 27. Uh, <laughs> and as a young boy, I was confronted by parents that were accented. Only the Yankee Doodles in the class had grandparents. And wherever we went, the numbers on the flesh were ubiquitous. I wonder how many of my children have seen numbers, and if my grandchildren have seen any at all. In this regard, I want to relate three stories. Eric Yom Kippur is the most crowded day in the men mikvah, SRO, Squeeze room only. <laughs> and in my neighborhood, it's a pretty devout neighborhood, Erevim Kippur, the mikvah is so crowded and boisterous and noisy and ill. And I cannot relate this delicately because in the mikvah there's no way to conceal because everything is revealed. And everyone is wishing it, very, very boisterous. And there's one kid from across the street from the Orsameach Yeshiva for beginners. How do I know it's from Orsameach? It said on his t shirt, or some Ech wrestler. I'm just joking. <laughs> he had an earring and a ponytail. He, he was clearly not a chassid, nor your shalom. And he felt legitimately very much out of place in this audience. And he placed his palms over his biceps, very apparent to me and everyone else, that he had a tattoo that was not appropriate for Erev Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. I dare say not appropriate for Gansh or Freilach, but certainly not the eve of Yom Kippur. And the people in the spectrum were not especially subtle, about as subtle as heavy metal is subtle. <laughs> and they're gawking and getting this poor kid who's highly embarrassed. He's about to step into the pool, and then he slips and trips and grabs the rail, and there's this roaring silence in the mikvah. <laughs> Sphinx-like silence. Picture a forest after trees felled. Imagine the mudville stadium after Mighty Casey struck out. <laughs> and no one is moving. The kid dies a thousand deaths as these lewd and gory tattoos are flying through the air. Nothing could have been less appropriate. In my life, I have never, ever witnessed such embarrassment. He turned out alabaster, and so I'm cogitating he'll jump in, and I'll never come out. Hmm. And before it was so boisterous, and now it went silent. You get in heartbeats. And then, this story happened 21 years ago, an elderly neighbor of mine walked across the moist marble floor. It was 21 years ago, I can still hear in my ears, the thwack, 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 as he walked across the moist marble floor. He went over to this kid who was more dead than alive and said to him this heavily Yiddishy, European accent in English, don't tell him, come on. I also have a tattoo, pointed numbers going up his flesh. In other words, you went to your Gehenim and I went to my Gehenim. Mm. Let's begin Yom Kippur together. Oh. Spontaneous, everyone over, wish them a good year. And I shall not I saw one small thing can make all the difference in the world. My next story is I have a friend. Well, actually, my friend has a friend. We share a friend. His name is Dr. Ike Hirschkopf. He's a psychiatrist in Manhattan. 
I wrote a book on depression titled Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. <laughs> and Dr. Ike Hirschdorf grew up in Washington Heights, which is a neighbor of northern Manhattan, in the 50s. And growing up in the Heights in the 50s, you saw a lot of numbers on the flesh. And in the summer day vacation, the Rockaways, and it was everywhere. So much so that when he was nine years old, he said to his mother, when do I get, he said to his mother, when do I get my number? Which caused her to run out of the kitchen crying. Dr. Ike Hirschkoff's uncle is a physician in the Catskill Mountains, and his aunt, the doctor's wife, is his receptionist. And she called him and said, Ike, on Sunday, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein is coming to the clinic. Would you like to meet him? What kid who grew up in the Heights in the 1950s wouldn't give the right arm to meet Rabbi Moshe? So he scrubs his face and puts on his junk to finery. He gets to the office really early. He's looking as religious as he can. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Waiting for Moshe to walk in. And it gets more and more and more full and more and more people. And finally, Rabbi Moshe and his entourage come in and he's starstruck. And his aunt goes right over to Rabbi Moshe and says, Rabbi Feinstein, I'm very sorry, but there's many people here. You're going to have to wait your turn. <laughs> and she plants a kiss on his cheek. <laughs> and Ike Hirschkoff melted through the floor. And he finally able to emerge. He crawled over in his halting, broken Yiddish. He said, I'm going to shh, shh, My dad, see, I said, it's a woman. I'm so sorry, my aunt. She doesn't know. She's not religious. And I said, she has the numbers. She's holier than I. And the last story I want to recount, I heard in this very room, out of Cooperman's first yard site, Dr. Debbie Lifshitz spoke. She told one story after another, and she was hitting him out of the park. I mean, with such a subject, it's not so difficult. But the story that really resonated with me is in the early years of Mithlala, a student applied from Petah Tikva and she was rejected. And her father called up Rav Cooperman. She said, I'd like to speak with you. Cooperman said, I'd be happy to meet with you, but I'm not going to change my decision. Your daughter has not been accepted. But if you wish to come, you may come. It was a hot summer day. He came in short sleeves. And after a few minutes, he said that she may come to the Michlala. And I'm not sure how the story goes at this point, but Dr. Lishit said, what happened? He said, it was a hot summer day. He was wearing short sleeves, and I saw the numbers. I couldn't say no to this man. So I go from there. Are we still able to handle this? Yeah. No. Honestly, going. Yeah. 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 Oh, right. <laughs> Cruel, unusual punishment. <laughs> okay, aside from numbers, I wanted to know as a child, why? how did my father make it to America when so many millions were deprived of this opportunity, including my grandparents? That brought me to study the, the voyage of the doomed ship to St. Louis, which sailed in 1939 in May. 937 Jewish passengers. 736 had legitimate visas to go to America, but they'd only be valid in three months' time. The rest had kosher paperwork to go to Cuba. When the boat docked in Havana, it was tethered to the port. You could look up and see the passengers. At this point, the Cubans demanded a bribe. Now, in Central America, Latin America, Spanish America, a bribe is a way of life. I'll bet you that one of the first words you learn in Spanish is El Bribo. <laughs> <laughs> so if they want a bribe, what should you do? Let's try that again. Nearly a thousand Jews on a boat, and they need a bribe. What should you do? Bribe. Right. Give a bribe. How are they saying in Staples? That was simple, or something like that. But the leader of American Jewry, his name was? Wise. Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, and we used to call Haggai Haggadol Hazer. <laughs> Rabbi Wise was the quintessential reform rabbi. Good crop of hair, well-built, stage presence, oratorical abilities, cushy cushy with FDR, Eleanor, members of the cabinet, a bribe. A bribe's against the law. And the irony of ironies was that had somehow they managed to make it into Cuba and that required housing or education, they would have come up with the millions, but not to violate the law. And here's a hero whose name you may not know, James G. McDonald, 
retired laborlessly, labor, tired all the time, to try and grant a haven for Jews, <coughs> appealed to the president, named after the highway in Manhattan. <laughs> and by the way, if you would ask a Jew in the 30s, who was a leader, they would respond in Yiddish, in the Dry Velten. There's three words. There was a world in Yiddish Velt. In the Dry Velten. Der Velt, Yanner Velt, and the Roosevelt. <laughs> this world, Olam Haba, and in the same breath, Roosevelt. So he appealed to Roosevelt, let in the boat. Because the captain of the ship, Gustav Schroeder, a German, was a benevolent, magnanimous humanitarian. And he figured, well, America is a humane country, and 736 have legitimate visas for America, albeit not yet valid. So he steams the ship up and down the eastern seaboard. How does America greet the boat? With a Coast Guard cutter to intercept. And had somehow they jumped off and swam their 20 miles to Miami, had this been doable, they would have been sent back. So McDonald is doing all he can and appeals to FDR and let them in. That's rejected. He then comes up with another plan. They're in Cuba. The Virgin Islands is next door. It's right in the hood. It's an American territory. So FDR himself replies in response of Gordon Hull, the Secretary of State from Tennessee, a Southerner. No sympathy at all for a refugee. Some say at this point he was already senile. It's in the 70s. He gave the ultimate, the perfect, the quintessential catch-22. The only way they can come as refugees to American territory would be on a tourist visa. Uh -huh. And to have a tourist visa, you must have a home to go back to. But these are German Jews. They were deprived of citizenship from the Nuremberg Laws in 1935. So therefore, they can't come as tourists, as refugees to America. The State Department's visa division was headed by Breckridge Long mm -hmm. from Fort Worth, a rapid anti-Semite. <coughs> the short on Long is that he'd do everything possible to slam the door of America so no one can enter. One spin-off of State Department policy were the Musi negotiations. If you're not familiar, that means you don't read enough Teller books, but it's rectifiable. <laughs> Jean-Marie Moussi was the former Swiss president. He was a chum of, him, of Himmler, a sympathizer of the Nazis. But during the war, his perspective changed. Towards the end of the war, the end of the, end of the fall of 1944, the Gdolim of America, the Vag Hatzala, such as Ravon Cutler, Blazer Silvram Kalmanovich, of Yasha Ber Soloveitchik, an important Balabatin like Irving Bunim, Mike Tress, Louis Septimus, Stephen S. Klein, working around the clock, under men that are staffed, under financed, to try and save Jews, want to save the 800,000 Jews still alive in the camps. They negotiate with the Sternbach family in Switzerland, negotiating with <coughs> Musi, who deals with him. Himmler is a very dangerous person. He's the top cop in Nazi Germany. And he negotiates because he's much more practical than Hitler. He wants to save his skin. The war is over, but not the war against the Jews. And since he's the top cop, he's afraid that when they liberate the camps, the guards in the camps are his acolytes. He wants them to have the status of POWs. He's afraid they'll murder them on the spot, kill them on the spot as war criminals. So he negotiates. And he demands medications and trucks, which the Vatican seller cannot come up with. He then changes his demand to five million Swiss francs, about the equivalent of one million dollars. Now, I'm aware of the fact that a million dollars <coughs> is not what it is today. But a million dollars is 800,000 lives? That's Borscht Billig. That would have been the greatest rescue effort in the history of history. But the Vatican doesn't have a million. But the Joint Distribution Committee does have a million. So Ryan Cutler travels to the Joint. Rabarin is the classic Lithuanian Rosh Hashiva. Gray, short, long black coat, svarim, stooped, maybe even a little dandruff. He does not converse in English. He speaks Yiddish. <coughs> Irving Gunam, the head of Young Israel, is his translator. They go before the joint and say, we need $1 million to save 800,000 lives. That should have been a rhetorical request. And the joint says, we can't do it. 
We can't do it because it means violating the British blockade, which was sacrosanct. And it means it's after Pearl Harbor. It means trading with the enemy. That's a crime. That's a felonious crime. Maybe it's even a treasonous crime. But to the Gdolim of America, it is despicable to violate American law. And it's odious to give money to the Germans. Yet far more important is Torah law, which means to save a life, pikuach nefesh, which means to save a captive, pidyon shvuyim, which means not to stand by your brother's blood, which means our responsibly one Jew towards his brother. And our Rebbe begs and pleads, he will not give in. Cajoles and weagles, and finally, if I say, okay, we'll give you the money, provided you get a license from the American government, then you give one million dollars to the Nazi enemy. Only one person in America will be authorized to give this money, and again, that was the president, named after Highway Manhattan. So Rebbe with a raging fever, travels to Washington, with Irving Bunim. And apparently the president felt that the plight of 800,000 Jews was not important enough for his time. He sends him to his hyper-assimilated Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau Jr. As you can imagine, being a Secretary of FDR's time, he an extremely assimilated Jew, which he was. Morgenthau Jr. celebrated Christmas and Easter. And Ravarin appeals to him. And he will not give in. And again, he cajoles and wheedles. And finally, in desperation, he tells Butum the translator, Butum, tell him, you are worthless, and Washington is meaningless, but you can't save the life of one child in Europe. There is no way in the world Irving Butum is going to tell the Secretary of the Treasury in the White House, you are worthless, and Washington is meaningless. So he gives him a milk-coat version. The rabbi is very disappointed. <laughs> he hope in the future you can be a greater help. Now, Rebaran doesn't understand English, but as I like to joke, he was an observant Jew. <laughs> he sees from Henry Morgenthau Jr.'s expression that what he had said had not been accurately translated. He said, Bunum, tell him precisely what I told you. At that point, Irving Bunum, not about to violate the dictates of the Gadol Ador, looks down into his shoes to see if his laces are tied, and socks are pulled up, and other matters of sartorial concern. He says in a barely audible tone, Mr. Secretary, the rabbis asked me to inform you that you are worthless. <laughs> and Washington is meaningless if you can't save the life of one child in Europe. At that point, Henry Morgan Jr. collapses on the table like this for what appears to be an eternity. When he finally raises his head, his eyes are deltas of red, tears cascading down his cheeks. Tell the rabbi, I've not forgotten who I am. I'll put my neck on the chopping block to save my brethren. And Henry Morgan and is a great hero. Often this plan was scuttled by American Jewry and Swiss Jewry, and Hitler himself intervened to make sure it wouldn't happen. But Morgan Thau Jr. will go down in history as the one who's willing to risk his career on behalf of his brethren. And here's a very important take home message. In life, we have to make difficult decisions. You make the convenient one, this is the way you'll be forgotten. You make the difficult one, that is the way you'll be remembered. An example which you're much more familiar with, Oscar Schindler was a, a man with a very checkered past. A womanizer, dishonest businessman, a boozer. He wrote the book on dysfunctional marriage. But that critical time said nearly 1,200 Jews. And forever after, the name Schindler has become synonymous with heroism, Bravery, courage, self-sacrifice, synonymous. Like Vaseline means petroleum jelly, <laughs> and Kleenex means tissues, and Q-tips means cotton swabs, and Plastel means Band-Aid. Schindler means self-sacrifice. He changed his name, and we can too. Leopold Pfefferberg, I'm a, do I'm a senior docent in Yad Vashem. And when I give a tour in Yad Vashem, I point out Schindler's list, not the film, the list. Number 173 is Leopold Pfefferberg. He's one of Schindler's Eden. And he was determined to make Schindler's tale known, because he was convinced that Schindler had saved his life. And after the war, he moved to America. Right after the war, Schindler needed money, gave him a check for $15,000. That was a lot of money in the 1940s came to America, 
adopted an American named Paul Page, opened a leather goods store in Beverly Hills, and whoever came into a shop, he tried to convince them to tell the story of Schindler. Now in LA, there's script writers, and producers, and directors. You can never get their attention. One day, an Australian novelist, Thomas Kinley, walked in innocently to buy a leather briefcase, and he couldn't get his credit card to work. Till he could get Sydney on the phone, it took half an hour. Spielberg unspooled and told him the story of Schindler. He was intrigued. He postponed his flight for one day, spent the night at Pfefferberg's house, resulting in him writing Schindler's List. Then Pfefferberg, through one of his customers, got the phone number of <coughs> Steven Spielberg, famous film producer. And every week he called him up and hocked him a china. <laughs> you got to make a film about Schindler. Spielberg just finished producing E.T. in the middle of producing Jurassic Park. <coughs> and Pfefferberg said then, stop spieling with the dinosaurs. <laughs> stop playing with the dinosaurs. Make a film about Schindler, and I guarantee you an Oscar for Oscar. O-S-C-A-R for O-S-C-A-R. Oh, wow. <laughs> and as you know, Schindler's List won seven Oscars, including Best Picture. Nearly eight decades later, after the Holocaust, the story of children is the only story left to be told first person. And if you don't have a psychological background, the story of children has to be the most insightful kind of human condition. So how do we tell this sort of tale? I believe, and I'm really trying to be quick, because uh, I feel for you. If I felt enough for you, I would stop. But. <laughs> The story is similar like the story they tell about the Baal Shem. It was told that the Baal Shem was able to go to a particular spot in the forest, despite they recite a specific formula, and an angel appeared. One generation later, yeah, 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 yeah. They knew where that spot in the forest was, but they didn't know the formula. And yet a generation after that, they didn't know the specific spot, nor did know the formula. And we, we don't even know where the forest is. So what do we have, the grandeur and sublimity of Baal Shem Tov? We have everything, because we know the story, and the story brings us back. I once told a group of elementary school children to try and explain to what it was to mean to lose one and a half million children under the age of 12, go home and make one and a half million X's. Maybe then you can relate to just the number. Because the crime is infinite, and the personal and familial tragedy incomprehensible, we have no other choice but to try and explain what happened in a medium that the brain can digest. So after the Anschluss, after Austria was, had a referendum and they voted to be under Nazi dominion, and then Austrian Jewry was subjected to the Nazis, and all these pictures and films and stills were sent to the West, America, Particularly, even the cabinet were concerned about the plight of one Austrian Jew. His name was? Sigmund Freud. Correct. And the way the mind works, which is kind of funny to say about Freud, <laughs> but the way the mind works, it's easy to think about one over 180,000. What's the most famous story of the Holocaust? Frank. Correct, Anne Frank. It's easy to think about Anne Frank over six million. It's easy to think of six million paper clips Apocalypse over six million souls. That's the way the mind works. But the fact of the matter is that Anne Frank's diary is not a reflective story. She wasn't in the ghettos, wasn't in the camps, she had a roof over her head, a modicum of food, she was with her family. But because it's a story, it's easier to relate. And perhaps also the very thought of relating to children being murdered is just a tad too difficult. It's too painful to think about mass executions. So she's been designated as the child representative of the Holocaust. <laughs> I've read through many diaries, and I'm trying to just connect to our theme of tonight. And they all share the children's resistant resilience and their willingness to extend themselves on behalf of others. Despite the Nazi nightmare, they did all that they could to rise above their own terror and ease the suffering of those around them. <laughs> Child after child tells how they tried to save the lives of others. And these diaries 
tell what it's like for a child to live every day knowing this could very well be the last day of their lives. Portray what it's like to live under constant Gestapo harassment, the grind of searching for the most basic necessities, the terracing friends and relatives sent to their deaths. The children were the smugglers, the snatchers, climbing over the walls or under the fences, and coming back with a scrap of carrot, a piece of potato which they had bartered, bartered for. And when they came back, what did they do with this little scrap of food for which they risked their lives? They would give it to a pregnant woman or an elderly rabbi. Those were the smugglers. And I'm going to read to you a very brief selection from the diary of seven-year-old Ephraim Steckler. By far not the most dramatic or horrifying, doesn't depict the Nazi atrocities. It's the story of a boy forced to live in a cupboard, hideous solitary confinement, where he was unable even to stand up. The Polish lady that housed him barely kept him alive and certainly did not show him any compassion. His feet were twisted backwards, it took months of medical treatment before he was able to learn to walk at the age of seven. And here are his words, that of a seven-year-old. The post lady flogged me with her husband's belt, saying, I'll drown you in the well this very day. She then feared that the Germans would find me and would kill her as well as me. She decided to break my heart, that she could tell the Germans that she had found me dead. But to my luck, she did not succeed, for I was a mere child and couldn't understand what death was, so I wasn't afraid of it. The children did not become the, the mindless automatons that the Germans had devised all, German, all Jews to become. Instead of becoming irreparably damaged under such, we would imagine, under such conditions, they continued to thrive as youngsters. Dr. Yafa Eliach reports that in the Raden ghetto, children played with dolls made of rags, engaged in make-believe games surrounding burying the dead, smuggling food, instructing babies not to cry in the presence of Germans. Psychiatrist Viktor Frankl wrote about his experiences in the concentration camp and the others who tried to maintain their mental health. Their success was consequential to a spirit of resistance and focusing on servicing others. Those who survived psychologically intact had to believe that what they did on a daily basis could make the difference. So the children who kept diaries, spelt, hoped that their testimony would live for them afterward. And as we saw tonight, the testimonies of humankind that this would never happen again. The diaries reveal the children's resilience and how they're willing to extend themselves for others. And reading through the diaries, they realize that children at the end were less naive and trusting than they were in the beginning, but they still espoused the same values they started off with. Somehow, they learned to love and care even deeper for those with purpose in life. Let me try and share with you, after all it is, a devout Torah of sorts. You go to the Children's Memorial in Yad Vashem, I'm sure most of you have seen it. Thanks to the genius of the architect, it is as black as dark can be. And there's a reflection of what appeared to be a million candles to commemorate the one half million children who perished. And you hear a tape in Yiddish, Hebrew, and English of children's name who perished until you run, run, run out. And here's an insight from Rabbi Barrow Wine. The one name you don't hear is your own name. Now think about this all the time. Moshe Rabbeinu had many beautiful names. Avigdor, Tuvia, Yedidya. And yet and yet he's always referred to as Moshe, Kimina Mai Mishisuhu. He was drawn forth from the river. He always had the visage before his eyes. He could have been alligator fodder at the bottom of the river. But his life was saved. If he was saved, if for no other reason, on behalf of others, to do something significant with his life. So that brings me to children's children survivors. Because when the war was over, understandably, those that were saved and those that survived wanted to tell the story and how they had survived and how they'd been betrayed. But those who didn't tell the story, 
and basically never have, were the children. <coughs> they couldn't tell it then, and it's always gone untold. So this became my life's mission. And a good number of years ago, I decided to travel the world and gather the stories of children in a fight against time. Meeting children in the groups of old age as they shared with me their stories, which resulted in our book, Heroic Children, which we worked on for 14 years. <coughs> we made, finally, after 14 years, we made a very draconian deadline to meet and publish it. And we met the deadline, but we made one little mistake, which was not so insignificant. We're about to go to press, and we didn't yet have a cover. Now, a cover is a very important component of a book. I always say, those who say they don't judge a book by its cover, <laughs> I know they never tried to sell a book. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to find a cover in no time. So I put my team on it. That means my kids. <laughs> and going through archives, and we came across this picture. I don't know if you can see it from the distance. It's a picture that was shot the day that Auschwitz was liberated 75 years ago. And the picture is sepia. And it's a large picture. Many, many children. We zoomed in, and the copyright holder is the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. Now, to use a picture for a cover, you need permission. So I sent them a request. They have to sign an affidavit. You're not going to make any changes. And I wrote them, like, this change, and this change, and that change, and this change, and this change, and that change, and this change. And the next day, they said, you can have it. But till the picture will be changed from low resolution to high resolution, will take three weeks. <laughs> Three weeks. I don't think I had three days. But everyone knows. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> to turn a picture from high risk to low risk takes 10 seconds, not three weeks. But the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is a large bureaucracy, over 300 employees. So you'll pardon me for being an Israeli. I thought what was indicated here was protexia. <laughs> and I have a friend of Baltimore. He was a very powerful individual. They say that in his cell phone, he has the private phone number of every senator and congressman. And I figured Baltimore, Washington, this is a shoo I'm sure he was connected. And his son, Linda Yeshiva, right next to my house. So I ran to Yeshiva, here in Yishlam, that is. I said, Aryeh, I think this is a rhetorical question. Aryeh, is your father connected to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington? And he said, no. <laughs> Shrek and I had. Disenchanted, crestfallen, melancholy. I'm walking out the room, and he says, but my mother is on the board. <laughs> He's going to wring his neck. His mother's a judge, Chaya Friedman. I sent her an email. I said, judge, I need this picture. Here's the lot number, the specific number. I need it yesterday. The next morning, I have the picture. But then I thought, if you look at the picture, what I wanted to do, my methodology of touring, of guiding in Yad Vashem is always to highlight the individual. How can one relate? The way Yad Vashem was created by the curators was to be guided. And at any time, there are dozens of tour guides, on, it fits my brain, on spooling data that the head cannot absorb. I'm always telling a story so we can better connect, a personal story. So I wanted to highlight one child. Now, I figured this required a little permission because that's changing a picture. I was going to color the rest of the CPU. I was going to highlight the individual, which is my methodology. So once again, I said, I said, Chaya, I need your help desperately. I got to get permission to color one child. And she writes back, she's convening a murder trial, <laughs> and she has no time. I said, Chaya, this is killing me. <laughs> and I prevailed upon her, and she writes me back, yay, yay, nay, nay. I made the request, I cannot assure you they're going to agree. And I'm thinking to myself, come on, this is the Holocaust. It's apple pie, it's mom, it's the flag. They're not going to say no. And that day, I'll use the technical term, that night, at 10 o'clock, we had a press queue in the largest press in Israel, arguably the largest press in the Middle East. Three hours for press queue, or to be accurate, two hours and 48 minutes, <laughs> I get an email from the head archivist, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and she writes, Dear Rabbi Teller, we regret to inform you, you may not use the picture. 
If you wish to use the picture in its pristine state without any alterations, you may. But once you make the slightest change, you don't have permission. And you want to highlight this boy. He recently spoke out. He's very sensitive. And our legal department said unequivocally, you may not use the picture. Shrek and a half. I got the plates are burnt. They're on the drums. At 10 o'clock, I'm going to have 10,000 covers. But I'm not such a pushover, a bit of a fighter. I write her back. Please send me his name and his phone number. I wish to speak with him. One hour and 36 minutes before press queue, she writes back, we don't know his name. We don't even know where he lives. It's, but, but, but you just told me that he sensibly spoke out. So 42 minutes before press queue, press, uh, for press queue, she sends me an online clipping of this picture. And on the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, those that were still alive from this picture went back to Auschwitz and pointed to themselves as youngsters in this picture. Of course, they in the grips of old age. It was apparent, I'll use the yeshiva term, it was mashma from this article that the boy that I had highlighted, his name was Hirsch. I didn't know if that was the first or the last name. And if he was Hirsch, it said he was from Europe. <laughs> I have now 31 minutes to find Hirsch in Europe. <laughs> so Sherlock Teller is thinking, where would, if you look at the picture, the kid looks pretty good. So I knew he couldn't be a Pole. <laughs> to look this good, you'd have to be Hungarian. <laughs> Hungary was conquered in March 1944. To be in this shape, you'd have to be Hungarian. So Sherlock Teller is thinking, where would a Hungarian survivor of Auschwitz live in Europe today? So I right away discounted England and Russia, that's Eurasia. So I'm down to about 29 countries <laughs> for 16 minutes. <laughs> and then I concluded that it would have to be either Belgian or Switzerland. And I have a really good friend, Maisha Luzer, who lives in Switzerland, who works for IBM. What a shidduch. So I call up Maisha Luzer and said, Maisha Luzer, I need you to find me Hirsch, who's an Auschwitz survivor in Switzerland. He said, would Hirsch be his first name or his last name? I said, I don't know. He said, is he from? Is he a religious man? I said, I don't know. He said, Hanoch, what have you been drinking? <laughs> I'm not drinking anything. I got eight minutes. I got five. I got Hirsch. You know what? You know what? I'm positive he's Hungarian. Look up Gabor or Tibor Hirsch. That's Hungarian for Micro Steve. And I hear him clicking and he says, Gabor Hirsch, 89 year old engineer. Here's his phone number. I called him up. My wife, Deutsch. I reached him. I asked him permission. He gave me permission. I fired off an email to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and I said, I have permission. If you don't believe me, here's the phone number. It's already 9 o'clock in Switzerland. Maybe call tomorrow. I want you to know, it would be more difficult for me to parallel park than to get his name on the first phone call. And I took that as an omen to tell the stories of the children. So sorry, I'm on the, on the You want? OK. So thank you very, very much. Uh, and, uh, Yes, the books. The books are. I have my book next door. I think you'll find it rich in ink. I know I will. And uh, I have some other titles. Buy so two to three books free. Buy four to three. Buy six. I think. Thank you, and let us hear it for the amazing. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, you're here. All right, so we really planned this evening. We worked very hard. Dini especially. Dini, you here somewhere? for Dini, yeah. And every little detail and their to-do lists and their folders. And, and then all of a sudden, this serendipity also. We get an email from Mr. De w. David, David Van Der a professional songwriter and singer, who saw our ad and said, I have a song for you. And so in the last moment, we have added him to our agenda, this beautiful song. And I give you uh, David Ben Rube. He is, does one man shows as well about Aliyah, about Zionism, about the Holocaust. Holocaust, Aliyah, yes, and William, just William. 
Okay, so we have this song, and then we have one more song, and then we'll have our, our evening will be done. Here, David Ben Rubin. Are you good with this? Thank you very much. Okay, this song uh, is part of my show called Beacons in the Dark about the rescuers of the Holocaust. And it's one of my six one-man shows. And this song was written uh, quite a few years ago when I visited the children's pavilion in Sha at, y uh, at Yad Vashem. And this moved me to write a song of a uh, tribute to the poor little children who didn't make it from the, the Holocaust. And the song is called All the Little Children. All the little children, all the little children, all the little children gone away. Little Jewish children, little Jewish children, not allowed to live another day. All the little children, all the little children, all the little children gone away. Little Jewish children, little Jewish children, not allowed to live another day. A million little children and half a million more into the flames of Auschwitz, trembling kinds of evil. All those little children not allowed to grow. This Denied the right to life by the monsters of the right. All the little children, all the little children, all the little children gone away. Little Jewish children, little Jewish children, not allowed to live another day. So now, children, take my hand. Fly with me to the promised land And there you will see little Jewish children like yourselves Playing happily And playing happily in our land of Israel All the little children all the little children, all the little children gone away. Little Jewish children, little Jewish children, not allowed to live another day. This is the story that I shall tell you about a miracle that befell. For out of the ashes of Auschwitz and the Holocaust of hell, there arose a state the state of Israel. All the little children, stars up in the sky, all the little children gazing down from on high, all the little Jewish children, they will never die. Thank you very much. It's a big honor to be here at this wonderful and amazing and informative evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I have no words. Amazing. I, I took you. this on sight on scene after I heard amazing. that song. Beautiful. To finish off our evening, and I want you to go out comforted. Zahaba, Tohar? Oh, there they are. Still here. Okay, I said we did a lot, of, a lot of planning goes into this evening, and it goes back at least as far back as Parshat Vayachi. How do I know that? Because when I was listening to the landing in Shul and thinking about this evening, and I saw uh, Hamala Chagoel, I thought that would be a, a lovely way to end the evening about the children. 
And then I spoke to, to Zahava and Tohar, and they said, we were thinking on Shabbos when we heard that we should play Hamalach Agawel. So uh, as far as I know, the tune is not one that all the little children would have known. Right, so it's, I think, a more contemporary tune than up from Cripper Chick. But we all know the famous story about Rev. Herzog Zetzal, right, after the war, that he went to the orphanages and he was able to identify the Jewish children by the words of Shema. And most of the younger children, probably, when they, we were talking about Kriyat Shema, Vamita, Krishna, right, and so some of them would have known the words, and the words should be words of comfort. It's a hard topic, the children. But we're here in Israel, and we will remember them, their voices were so stilled, but not silenced, okay? Zahav and Tohar. Okay, we'll need the lights down again. Lights?